So now we pick up and we got to ask ourselves, well, what about the parents? These guys obviously have a mom, a dad, something's going on. What are they doing while the kids are skipping school? So we're going to take a moment to learn a little bit about the parents. Antonio Treviso and his wife, Rebecca, the parents of Ron and Remesio, were working in their laboratory, shaded by a red tin roof. They were both environmental engineers who had been sent to the small mining town of Minas Nuevas by the World Bank, an organization that lends money to countries to study the possible ecological impact or environmental effects a dam might have on the rainforest there. In the 1950s, environmental science was fairly new. Most mining and lumber companies around the world paid little attention to the side effects their development projects had on the environment. Slowly, though, people were becoming aware that there could be disastrous results from projects like dams, which were supposed to help people. Antonio and Rebecca were the only people who worked in the South American Environmental Office for the World Bank. The department was so new, in fact, that many big shots at the World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C., were not yet aware of its existence. Antonio looked up from the report he was working on and squinted through his office window. He could just make out the top portion of the dam on the Rio de Oro, two miles upstream of the village. How that structure, made mostly from crude stone and mortar, had lasted so long was truly a wonder. Sighing, he thought about its history. According to legend, the Spanish conquistadors had first passed through this spot during their search for El Dorado, the fabled city of gold, 400 years earlier. Then, in 1650, another Spanish military expedition actually did discover gold along these riverbanks. Naming the river Rio de Oro, they put up a temporary settlement to see if a mining operation would be worth it, and it was. At least it was for them. The amount of gold they found excited the explorers, and they decided to build a permanent settlement a little farther downstream, at the junction of the Caroni River and the Rio de Oro. They named it Minas Nuevas, or New Mines. Extracting gold from mountains was very time-consuming, even with Indian slaves to do all the work. Shovels and pickaxes broke easily, and Spanish gunpowder was not powerful enough to blast the mountain rock. Although by engineering standards the mountain rock was considered soft rock, they needed the water power a dam could provide to help them separate the large rock from the gold. That first dry season, the Spanish army was able to build a solid arched structure about 150 feet high. The dam included two clever built-in shafts that would take water in from the lake, or reservoir, which had formed behind the dam, and shoot a continuous powerful burst of water through the front of the dam into the paddle wheels of a grinding mill. The paddle wheels, in turn, would move two large stones that crushed the rock from the mountains. This made it easier to separate the rock from the gold that was in it. The flowing water, controlled by heavy wooden gates, would only open or close with the efforts of ten strong men. Later, in the 1800s, when technology had improved, the gates were changed to steel and the addition of outside valves made it easier to operate. The small rocks that were separated from the gold the first three years were used to make a concrete-type mix. This mix was used during the fourth year to add 75 more feet of height to the dam because of unexpected seasonal flooding. Nothing lasts forever. Soon the available gold ran out and Minas Nuevas fell into obscurity. But the dam remained over 200 feet high, solid as a mahogany tree. Nothing changed for over 300 years. And then, in 1954, Minas Nuevas experienced another population boom due to the emergence of timber as a money-producing product. Dynamite and chainsaws made it easy to cut down trees. With boats that were powered by fuel, they could now transport the trees they felled up the Caroni River to Ciudad Guyana. Forest along both the Rio de Oro and the Caroni was being cleared at a rapid rate. Timber barrens sprouted up overnight, and it seemed that the forest began to disappear almost that fast, too. Miners also reappeared and began to blast even deeper into the mountains in their quest for gold. And they were successful. New and powerful vacuums allowed the river bottoms to be sucked up and then sifted for the valuable metal. The use of mercury, a highly toxic element, helped in separating the gold from the river silt. 
Powerful hoses using water powered from the dam could strip the mountain earth from the outside of the mountains in no time at all. This strip mining left the mountains scarred and ugly. All of these advances brought more settlers who wanted to get in on their share of the wealth. Minas Nuevas, passed off as a nearly dead village, was breathing once again. The rapid growth in population led to a variety of problems. Miners and loggers argued over land and money. They sometimes robbed each other. It was not unusual to settle disputes with guns. Local law enforcement was lacking because it was too remote an area to have a permanent judge and the jail was a corrupt joke. If you had money, you wouldn't stay in jail for too long. Disappointed citizens often took the law into their own hands. Antonio and Rebecca worried often about their two boys in this rough part of the world. As more people came to Minas Nuevas, more natural resources were needed to provide them with food and shelter. More trees were chopped down, more animals were hunted. Safe drinking water that had not been polluted by miners and loggers was needed. A system to pipe water into the town from the reservoir behind the dam was eventually created, and the reservoir area was finally declared off limits for any mining operations that used chemicals. Still, they continued to blast away at the mines and riverbanks above the dam. The chemical processing of gold took place near the base of the dam, since no one in the village was drinking that water. Though the water in the village of Minas Nuevas was kept fairly clean in this way, Pollution from the mining operations carried down the Rio de Oro and mixed with the Caroni River. This affected the Indians farther downstream who relied on the Caroni River for their drinking water. The government of Venezuela was considering building a huge hydroelectric dam at the junction of the Caroni River and the powerful Orinoco River. These two rivers joined only 20 miles downstream from Minas Nuevas. The government thought that such a dam could provide thousands of Venezuelans with electricity and help modernize the interior part of the country. The World Bank was considering a loan to Venezuela to build an amazing 700-foot-tall dam, much like the Hoover Dam in the United States. Many factors would go into deciding if Venezuela would be approved for the loan to build the dam. One factor, a very small factor in 1954, would be the environmental impact report that Antonio and Rebecca would submit. By studying the environmental effects of the dam at Minas Nuevas, Antonio and Rebecca believed they could predict the environmental impact a much larger dam at the junction of the Orinoco and Caroni rivers would have. When they had arrived in Minas Nuevas two years earlier, they were surprised at how much damage had already been done to the ecosystem because of the mining and logging. Malaria, for example, had never been a problem because the malaria mosquito lived high in the canopy of the rainforest. When the trees began to fall from the woodsman's axes, the mosquitoes came down with them. Now malaria was a deadly disease that led to sickness among Indians and settlers alike. Worse yet, Antonio and Rebecca were beginning to suspect that the mercury used for processing gold was poisoning the fish and the drinking water downstream. Indians were becoming sick at an alarming rate, and incidents of birth defects were becoming commonplace. Socially, this development was having an adverse effect on the indigenous culture. The rainforest Indians, of which there were fewer every year, lived much as they had thousands of years earlier. They did not recognize or understand borders created on their land by governments that were established long after the Indians were there. Settlers and even the government took land that these Indians lived and hunted on. The extraction of the natural resources was killing the plants the Indians used for medicine and food, and it was driving away the animals that they hunted. Diseases that newcomers brought easily infected and killed the local Indians because they had built up no immunity to these new diseases. A simple cold could kill an Indian. The Trevisos feared one tribe, the Yanomami, was quickly headed for extinction. Another tribe, the Shentai, was more nomadic and mysterious than the Yanomami, but they too were running out of rainforest due to the rapid clearing and industrialization of the Amazon River Basin. Even as Antonio and Rebecca worked on the report, many more engineers were working on the plans for construction of the new dam 20 miles downstream. Those engineers proceeded as if approval for the new dam was already a reality. The two points of view illustrated the controversy in most development projects. Was it worth giving thousands of people electricity, 
even if by doing so you hurt the environment and destroyed the way of life of a much smaller group of people, could one be done without doing so much damage to the other? Experts like Antonio and Rebecca could easily understand how changing or eliminating one thing in the rainforest could have a bad effect on 10 other things in the rainforest. Those 10 things would then affect 100 other things, soon causing a terrible environmental chain reaction. Their job was to document, to record the changes in the environment that most people did not think or care about. They were already convinced that there was a serious problem in the Amazon River Basin and were certain that the creation of a huge hydroelectric dam would be an ecological disaster. That is what the report to the World Bank would say. Two years of study were coming to an end. They would be leaving Minas Nuevas with Ronan and Raimesu in one week to present their findings at a conference in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, and they were ready to leave. The last two years had been very disillusioning for both of them. Minas Nuevas was a rough town, and they worried constantly about the influences it had on their children. They were also sure that the hydroelectric dam 20 miles downstream would be constructed despite the recommendations, and they felt as if they may have wasted the last two years. Antonio stopped reflecting on the history of the dam and looked over at his wife, who, as usual, was busy. But today she wasn't busy at her microscope. Today she was busy making a double-layer chocolate cake with double chocolate frosting for the twins. They would be bringing it to the school in a little while for a surprise celebration. Antonio Treviso considered the day that he met Rebecca to be the luckiest moment of his life until the twins had been born. They were both the spitting image of their Hispanic father, except for the bright green eyes they had inherited from their Irish mother. Their eyes contrasted so sharply with the chestnut skin and dark hair they inherited from their father that they drew constant and often envious looks from strangers. Roan was named after Rebecca's deceased father, and Remesio after Antonio's. They were a striking pair of twins, and other than their parents, the only Treviso was still alive. Man, it's a beautiful day. I can't remember the last time I saw the sun, Antonio said, interrupting his peaceful thoughts in the silence in their laboratory. Rebecca looked up from the frosting in her mixing bowl, smiled and wiped her hands on her apron, a beautiful gift from some of the local village women. We saw it seven weeks ago today. Don't you remember? The miners were having that big party over at that odd fellow's house. I think his name was Bocho. And then it started to pour, and the boys told us it would last for seven weeks. Amazing, isn't it? Antonio nodded. The boys had told them that the rains would last for seven weeks instead of the usual three. When they asked the twins how they could be so sure of this, they said that the Shintaya had told them. Smiling, he moved next to his wife to help her with the frosting. But first he gave her a big hug. Rebecca leaned against Antonio and smiled back. She couldn't wait to deliver the cake and share it with all the kids at the school. And then the explosion.